Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, Allah, Rasulullah, assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone, I hope you're all doing well, and salam to the Nakabi diaries. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a feeling that this might be a triggering video, um, so I, I wanted to start off by saying that, inshallah, me and you come here with good intentions, okay? This isn't for clout or attention we we don't care for that me and you are both reverts to islam we're both very visible muslim women not only do we strive to implement islam into our everyday but we are also muslim women who have lived in two different parts of the uk and throughout our journey we have had to deal with discrimination mm -hmm. firsthand, you know, verbal and physical. We are constantly being asked to justify our choices, our choice to cover, our place in our families and our place in societies, constantly fighting off stigmas, misconceptions, stereotypes, in the multitude of ways that they are thrown at us. I have to say that Ayan and other people like her have a part to play in some of the things I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. This is why we are here. You know, there's always a lot of talk around Muslim women and, you know, this and that and how we're victims and all the rest there. I normally wouldn't advise that we give people like Ayan the time of day, but I thought maybe we'd be able to share some beneficial points. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I agree with what you said. Yeah, so that's why we're here. Okay, so I don't know much about Michaela. Is that how you pronounce her name? Yeah, yeah, it's Michaela. So I don't know about, much about her personally. I know some of her dad's work. So in terms of her, I'm completely ignorant of her work and, and, and stuff like that. Anyway, so should we start with the intro? Yeah, let's go for it. Bismillah. To episode 140 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. This episode was intense, to say the least. It's an opposing views on Islam. I had Muhammad Hijab on one side, an author and philosopher interested in political philosophy and comparative religion, and I had the pleasure of speaking to Ayan Hirsi Ali, an author, scholar, and former politician best known for her activism against women's treatment in Islam. I'm incredibly honored to be able to host these kind of conversations and to be able to speak to two sides of contentious subjects. I'm never happy when one side goes after the other side and attacks them personally rather than attacking their ideas. I left this opposing views kind of freaked out and fairly aggravated, to be honest, but I haven't edited anything because I think it's best to show what and how everyone said things, regardless of how uncomfortable it was. So, so what did you think of that? Okay, so when I started watching it, because Marshall, I used to read the link here, yeah, and I started watching it, and I just thought, oh my God, what's happened? Like the way she did the introduction, obviously, I know Brother Mohammed Hijab can be very kind of strong in his opinions and the way he expresses himself, but it was clear from the introduction that there's <laughs> something a little bit edgy kind of going on, because obviously Michaela's a female as well. You've got a Muslim male on one side talking mm -hmm. about Islam for Islam, and then the non-Muslim, so-called ex-Muslim female on the other side. So she, she, even the way she announces the interview, she clearly states that she had the pleasure of speaking to Ayan, where she, she obviously doesn't sound like she had the pleasure of speaking to Mohammed Tijab at all, which obviously wasn't something positive. She, could, she expressed being frustrated and um, like it was quite tense for her because she actually pointed out clearly that she doesn't like that people go against, um, you know, the person personally. She prefers it when they just go against their ideas. And I respect that and I do definitely agree with that as well. I feel like from the beginning, you can see that she almost felt sorry for her. And I don't know like how the interview yeah. was done because it seems that she spoke to them both individually and then put the two things yeah. together. So I don't know if she spoke to yeah. Mohammed Hijab first <clears throat> and then spoke to Ayan, but I would assume that she spoke to Mohammed Hijab first. That's what I would assume just from yeah, that's interesting. how she felt. Yeah. 
I think the thing for me is this is the disadvantage to the setup. Yeah, definitely. You know, because although I agree with you, um, there should have been more mindfulness. I do think, in fact, that Mohammed's hijab was being mindful, probably anticipating not only what she's saying, but how she's saying it. If anyone is familiar with her work, you know, she has a way of putting information out there. She has a really uh, visible attitude and disgust uh, for, you know, Islam and Muslims and stuff like that. And it's very evident and we see it. Mm-hmm. So I think Mohammed Hijab was probably anticipating that attitude because he can't see it for himself. I think if this interview was to be done all on the same platform, I think he would have adapted Mm -hmm. or maybe not. We don't know. You never know. (laughs) You never know with Mohammed Tajab. The thing is, though, is that that was the setup. So it's almost going in blind. Michaela did say she wasn't really familiar with Islam and she wasn't really familiar with um, Ayan's work. And I think that's really telling. Anybody who is familiar, it's really hard to take her side if you are a human being that promotes justice and fairness and people's rights in terms of, you know, religious rights, who values those things. It's really hard to side with her. Mohammed Hijab, he's somebody that's very well researched. He has references. This is everything here. With the interview, like from the Ayan side, yeah. he had nothing, like literally nothing. I mean, he even yeah. quoted her yeah. book. Yeah. Whereas she didn't even quote her own book, as far as I remember. She yeah. never even quoted them. The conversation she had with Michaela was no substance. Yeah. Not only that, but it didn't evoke any yeah. questions from Michaela when Ian was talking. And Michaela didn't seem to have any further questioning for her after asking her initial questions because it was, she wasn't yeah. really given much to talk yeah. to go on. Again, that comes down to the setup. I think it's impossible for. Uh, one person be able to do the podcast on a regular basis with different types of people, different subjects and stuff like that. To be clued in, not to surprise that she didn't have follow-up questions, but I think in terms of this specific subject, follow-up questions are needed because there has to be fairness in the outcome of this conversation. And I don't believe that we always got that uh, because there wasn't follow-up questions on Michaela's side. I was talking to my husband about it and she was one of the first sort of open you know Islamophobes that had come across Uh, and I was like you know in her prime she was rife like her attitudes and everything that went with all the horrible things she used to say. I do believe that the best way to convey Islam is to take our emotions out of it. That's probably the best thing for us because if we were to constantly take in all the, the hate that we seem to get, it would take us to an unhealthy place. We are believers. We have everything we need in Islam. We don't need uh, validation or we don't need to be liked. <laughs> you know, it'd be nice, but we don't need it. Alhamdulillah. Were the people you were seeing in the Netherlands, were these other religious people, were like Christianity or, or atheist, agnostic, or just in general? Uh, many of them were Christian. So when I first arrived at the Asylum Seekers Center, most of the people who volunteered to help asylum seekers, refugees, uh, they did it through their churches. So they were Christians. And the Christianity that I saw that was practiced in the Netherlands was a very appealing Christianity. People were actually, um, I I thought, very generous, very tolerant. Uh, For instance, even though they volunteered to help us as non-Christians, they didn't demand that we convert to Christianity. They didn't preach their religion. They didn't impose on us in that way at all. and, and I thought that was interesting because when uh, I started to become an active Muslim and abide by these rules of, you know, the permitted and the forbidden and all that, and I, I really wanted to be a good Muslim. One of the things that our teachers were telling us was, you have to go and convert non-Muslims. And, uh, and I thought it was interesting when I came to the Netherlands that 
these Christians uh, were not imposing or preaching or proselytizing their faith. Uh, they believed that they were just doing good uh, for the sake of goodness itself. Mm. And, and, and so, but there were also agnostics, there were atheists. Uh, later on, as you know, I, I left the Asylum Seeker Center, I went to college, I found jobs, and uh, I was surrounded. Uh, by the time I left, 14 years later, by the time I left the Netherlands, I was surrounded more by agnostics and atheists than Christians. Can I just say something that's really ironic here? Mm -hmm. One of our books, she actually tells the Christians, you, know, you need to step up your dawah, yeah. you need to do it like the Muslims. Well, when she was saying that, I was just thinking, what? Because she mentioned, I think, in the beginning intro as well, that she's lived in a few different countries. So obviously she's from Somalia and she said she lived in Kenya as well, I think. I, mean, I think Saudi Arabia, actually, she mentioned before going to the Netherlands. And I was just thinking, okay, then, so mm -hmm. I don't know which country she was living in when she's saying that she was more practicing of Islam. They was telling her she needs to give Dawah to non-Muslims because how many non-Muslims were there for you to be giving Dawah to? Do you know what I mean? I, people do have Dawah organizations, but like, as far as I know, the Dawah game isn't that strong in those countries because like most, no, most people are Muslims anyways. The thing is, the concept of Dawah is not what she just portrayed it to be. Of course it isn't. We don't force people to become Muslim. Of course it not. It says that in the Quran itself, there's no compulsion in religion. This is what the Quran says. So this whole, you have to force people to convert, you know, that um, she even said, you know, oh, the Christians were really generous. They were really, if you look at the UK, especially around Ramadan, like we are the biggest charity givers in the UK. Exactly. And that might be her experience, you know, and I'm really not trying to get away from her. What I do want to say, though, is she really needs to start separating her experience of people to Islam. I don't think that suits her agenda or her but, but the thing that's, that's all they the do. They don't, they don't know how to separate their experience good or bad, from the actual facts. That's what we need to do if we're actually going to make progress because yeah. all of us could have had a bad experience. I could say, oh, I'm a Muslim because growing up as a Christian, yeah. I had such bad experiences, well, we, we but that's not why I became Muslim. I didn't become Muslim because, oh, somebody um, that, that was a Christian did yeah. something bad to me. So it's about the facts. Look mm -hmm. at the religion. And not only that, but when, yeah. when she was mentioning this stuff, I was just thinking, okay, have you ever heard of Christian missionaries? Really? Yeah. In Africa? Somebody who's yeah. coming from Africa. Yeah. You've lived in Kenya. Yeah. You've lived in Somalia. Don't tell me you've never seen Christian missionaries. They learn languages that nobody else takes time to learn just to propagate Christianity, subhanAllah. It's like this blissful ignorance of, of history as well. Like, hello, hello, France, Britannia, really? Come on, we could go further back than that. Like, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Let's move on to the next part. In your experience, <clears throat> is, is Islam innately misogynistic? The answer to that, unfortunately, is a clear cut yes. Okay. Islam is misogynistic in its approach to women. I know that by saying this, I uh, offend a lot of people. I know that people's feelings get hurt, the feelings of Muslims. I know that that is the case. But setting feelings aside and just looking objectively at what it is um, that Islam says about women and where it positions us, the answer is yes, it is misogynistic. And I'll give you a few examples. That would be good, yeah. And I think the best example, because it's so factual, is the law, Sharia law, Islamic law. Islamic law declares that a woman has to have a male guardian at all times. That's not required of males. In Sharia law, a man is permitted to have four wives. She's not permitted to have four husbands. In Islamic law, in Sharia law, a woman's testimony in court is worth half of that of a man. It's not the other way around. Um, a sister inherits half of what her brother inherits. Wow. And this goes on and on. And I think to be, because these basic tenets of law, Sharia law, 
when they're implemented and where they're implemented, you see a huge difference between the way men and women are treated, girls and boys are treated. And I would say that is misogyny. And because I'm not, I'm not that familiar with um, Islam, is Sharia law something that's in the Quran directly? Sharia law is derived from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam, and his legacy is a body of law and norms um, that are implemented where there is a theocracy like Saudi Arabia or Iran or any of the other societies that try to establish um, legal systems that are based on Islam. Um, okay. So another example on the misogyny side is women are expected to cover their bodies. And there is some kind of discussion on how much of that. In some cases, they let you show the face and the hands. And in extreme cases, you have to be covered from head to toe, um, confined to the house. Um, your male guardian uh, chooses, or at least you need his endorsement to marry someone else. And all of this is in, uh, based in Sharia law. If you're a woman and you're not happy in a marriage, it's almost difficult, almost impossible to divorce your husband. Uh, and the other way around, for a man to divorce his wife, all he has to say is declare in front of two witnesses three times that he divorces his wife and that's done. So on the question, is Islam misogynistic? I think these facts speak for themselves. For me, I think what is frustrating about conversations like these is when you look at something surface level, mm -hmm. but if you only scrape the surface, that's all you're going to get. And therefore you're going to jump to conclusions. You're going to make assumptions. All of them are going to be based on your culture, your knowledge, your perception of life. And that's part of the problem. Many people who are non-Muslim, they look at Nakabi woman and they think, ah, oh, she's weak and she's stupid. I don't think I've ever met a weak or stupid Nakabi woman. Exactly. You know? So people need to understand that there's so much more than just the stereotypes that they hear. And unfortunately, Ayan is known for pushing these false stereotypes and ideas of Islam and I would really advise Michaela and I say this with sincerity do not take your Islam from the likes of Ayan please look into it from actual sources actual scholars of the religion we don't just speak unlike some people we have evidence to follow alhamdulillah what people need to understand is that with everything in Islam. There's conditions, there's limitations. There's exceptions in some cases. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything is just blanketed in the way that it, mm -hmm. it's displayed here. That's why I go back to don't just take it from the surface. If you really want to get to know it, then spend that time on it from a non-biased perspective, which exactly. is not always easy when you have voices like Ayans around. I mean, for me, well, I, I don't know if it's because I've been Muslim for so long now. When she was even saying it, I was just thinking, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with a Muslim woman covering herself? What's wrong with her getting half of the inheritance? Because obviously I know why she gets half the inheritance. And I don't see that as being misogynistic. And throughout history, there was women who wasn't entitled to anything at all. Like they were just owned, especially in Western countries. They were owned even by the husbands. And does she know that even the thing, the, the culture where women, when they get married and they take on the husband's name, they went from the ownership of their father to the ownership of their husbands. We don't have that in Islam. We have our own identity. We always keep our names as Muslim women. Do you know what I mean? So she, she mentioned these things, but obviously she won't no. explain the reasons why yeah. because she's trying to bring it that it's a misogynistic something subhanallah it didn't make any sense anyway how many women sitting down watching it hearing that a man can have four wives mm -hmm. thinks to themselves oh i wish i could have four husbands yeah you know what i mean like exactly that's a really good point to make and don't want to talk too much about the polygyny now because i really want to talk about it at the time where yes of course um and this part specifically i thought muhammad hijab made some good points so i thought maybe it'd be good to actually oh, yeah, go and, play that and then maybe yeah. expand on that yeah 
uh, is Islam inherently misogynistic? Well, first and foremost, of course, there are misogyny needs to be defined because if it's defined definitionally as it is in the kind of dictionary, the hatred of women, then the answer is very clearly no. Because the Quran very clearly states in more than one verse, you know, in chapter 3, verse 195. In the that God does not let to waste any action of any doer among you, men or women, and that both of you are from one another. That uh, in chapter 33, verse 35, uh, the, the believing men and the believing women, and the you know, and so on. And it mentions a, a, a list of attributes, mentioning men and women specifically, and then says that God has prepared for them a reward. And in fact, the Quran explicitly mentions that we cannot have hatred towards any believer. Because it's mentioned in chapter 59 of the Quran, God, do not put any hatred to the believers in our hearts. And that, of course, includes women as well. So from that perspective, it's impossible to postulate. It is impossible to postulate that Islam is misogynistic from that definitional perspective. But what we will say is, of course, misogyny is a label that is used haphazardly and arbitrarily between people in the West in discourses to mean different things. So, of course, neoconservatives or people that are more right-wing or alt-right are excuse, accuse themselves of being misogynistic to, uh, uh, by um, third-wave feminists and so on. And so it really depends on who is the one making the claim and what the robust definition that they have of misogyny is. And sometimes that can be ideologically um, uh, kind of inspired. In the case of third-wave feminists, I would say it certainly is. That's why, unfortunately, uh, even your father has been uh, accused of misogyny. I mean, people in, in, in the West, uh, credible intellectuals and academics have been accused of misogyny just because they believe in a traditional uh, a value, uh, uh, traditional values of a family system, a complementarian family system. And uh, for this reason, they're accused of misogyny. So, but one has to say this, and I think this is very important, Michaela, that we believe that there is an equality of value between men and women. We do believe that there is an equality of value between men and women. The Prophet himself, Muhammad, he said, that certainly men are equal to women in front of the law. That is the general rule. That is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad. However, we do believe in exceptions, and we don't believe that equality of value means identicality in roles. And so, of course, people that are detractors from the other side, like the academic charlatan Ian McGann, who actually means refugee in the Somali language, of course, an ironic reminder to herself, she would say that Islam is misogynistic because of practices such as polygyny, of, which means that a man can marry more than one wife. And that is a practice that Muslims believe in. Or practices such as that Muslim men can marry Christian and Jewish women. And of course, that is something that Muslim women cannot do in Islam as well. And various other inheritance things or uh, aspects where there is a differential there between how men are treated to women. But we will say that equality of value does not mean identicality in roles. Let me say that one more time. Equality of value, we believe, does not mean identicality in roles. He said it very well, misogyny. That word gets thrown around everywhere now. It's overused, like many other words. <laughs> we are equal in Islam. Like this false narrative that's often pushed, you know, you as soon as you become a Muslim woman, you become a second-class citizen. We've heard that all before. It's not the case. And the reason we are secure in that is because we are believers. Me and you can say because we were raised in non-Muslim households, we had the freedoms that you know people often say that we should you know value and all the rest of it we, we had all that the reason we let it go is because we realized there was no value to it not everything is black and white again if you go back and have a real honest non-biased look at why certain things are in islam and look at it as a life system rather than just sharia law you may actually see the wisdom and the logic behind it a part of the problem is that muslims are not always a great example of it but the legislation in itself is perfect no i totally agree um and that's the thing i don't like i didn't want to spend this time going like you know kind of clarifying the points that she's made because there's hundreds yeah, of videos so online like explaining all of those different things and they're so easy to find but what yeah. what i find annoying is the fact that people like i am get this platform to speak against islam 
uh, you know, like they're representing Islam because she comes from a Muslim background. Like as reverts, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well. You come to you when you become Muslim, you'll get other Muslims coming and telling you what Islam is and what it isn't. Some of them might be practicing, and some of them aren't practicing at all. And when you decide you want to put the hijab on, they'll, they'll have an opinion about that. And when you want to put the niqab on, they've got an opinion about that because they're not doing it. And it's just like, well, yeah. actually, Islam has its own set of rules to follow. Then this is what Islam means is submission. You have to choose to submit. Nobody can be forced to submit. Submission is a sincere thing. You have to have sincerity. That's what the religion is. So why is it that these people who want to know about Islam, or they say they want to know about Islam, why is it that they find such a hard time just looking for an actual Muslim woman who actually practices Islam to speak mm -hmm. to? There's Muslim female scholars that are online. They have platforms they are teaching at Islamic mm. colleges and universities. Why wouldn't mm. you go and look for one of those? If, Why wouldn't mm. you, instead of even Muhammad Hijab, and no, this is no respect to the brother, well, like he's doing a very good job. But if you want to have these kind of conversations, especially with the focus being on Muslim women, why wouldn't you bring a Muslim woman who practiced the religion to go head to head with this Yani, this Ayan woman? Why? Mm. That, that would make more sense. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Because like you mentioned yeah. from the beginning, the setup itself is disadvantageous towards Brother Muhammad Hijab because he is literally going against two women. That in itself is, is quite imbalanced because obviously he's a man and mm. he's expressing himself the way every man has the right to express himself. So if somebody could say, oh, isn't he aggressive? And look at these two poor females here. Their conversation that they had mm. between each other was very tame and very like la di -da kind of, oh, that makes a lot of sense. You know what I mean? But if it was another Muslim yeah. female on the other side, yeah. somebody who's wearing correct hijab, and there are yeah. many of them that she could have chosen from, it would have been much more balanced. I can see what you're saying. Because we are the visible Muslims, and because we are so different sometimes in comparison to those who are non-believers, because of that, we're always getting stigmatised. At the beginning of the video, uh, you know, I mentioned a few things, and what people don't realise is, like, all these misconceptions and stigmas and stereotypes that are pushed out there they create a lot of suspicion and I think that's probably why Michaela is leaning towards you know a, a young because maybe there's some subliminal inbuilt suspicion when it comes to Muhammad Hijab mm -hmm. because he is a Muslim mm -hmm. and thanks to mass media and all the conditioning that has been very evident throughout the years people are not we're going to just sit down and actually take people's word for what it is. Why ask me the question if you're not ready to take my answer? Basically. You know, but it's, it's just, it's ridiculous, you know. And Ayan and people like her have a lot to blame for that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, all the resources, everything, these questions have been ans answered many times. It's not possible that we touch on them all in this video. Keep an eye out for part two of this discussion and also keep in mind that any mistakes me or the Nakaba Diaries make is due to our limitations. Any good in this video is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you want to support the channel then please like, share and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum.